Hi guys, we're here today with Kevin O'Leary, Mr. Wonderful from Shark Tank. I'm so happy to have him on the show. We're going to talk about startups, how to grow startups, how to scale startups. Welcome great. to the show. Thank you, Vance, so much. So great to be here. So we'll just dive right into it. Uh, the first question, uh, you mentioned if, if they don't come to work on Saturdays, to not bother coming to work on Mondays. Like, how did you execute this? Was this just for the executive team? How many years did you do it this way? Kind of, Phil, can you fill us in on this? You know, the, my, my, when, I, when I'm an operator, when I'm operating a startup, um, I, I believe that entrepreneurialism is a, is a journey, not a destination. And when you get involved in it, you have to understand you're competing globally. I don't care what product or service. You're competing with somebody in Shanghai or Mumbai who wants to kick your ass. Yeah. And they work 25 hours a day. They don't mess around. You have to have that mentality. You have to have that initiative. You have to have that almost sense of misbalance that you are 100% dedicated to the mission and you will be rewarded for that. I'm always about making millionaires, but this is not a nine to five gig. If you want that, go work for somebody. Go work for a big corporation where you can go to soccer games on the weekends. If you're gonna work for me, you're gonna work your ass off and I'm gonna make you rich. That's the message. That's not for everybody, Vlad, you know that. It's, so I'm looking for the people that I'm filtering out. When I give a mission statement like that to somebody, I'm getting hardcore people. Yeah. Because I need hardcore people to compete. It's, it's really hard to succeed today because barriers to entry are very low, you know that. Yeah. And it's an international competition at every level. So you gotta get ready to work like that guy in Mumbai is ready to work. And he's ready and she's ready to work very hard. Salespeople, what do you look for in your salespeople? Do you have any tests to give them? Do you use any sell a pen? How do you filter out yeah. the best salespeople? Here's how you measure um, and work with salespeople. When I go look at a new company today as an investor, I don't want to meet the CEO first. I want to meet the man or woman running sales. And I want to have dinner with them and I want to drink some wine with them. The hardest job in the company is the man or woman running sales because yeah. every month they start back at zero. And they, great salespeople, understand that challenge. There is no business without revenue. Revenue is the most important. If I understand the mentality and the vision and the kind of person running sales for any size company, that's the most important to me. Then I meet the CEO after I'm convinced that we've got a really great person running the sales team. How do you determine who a great salesperson is? Someone that can consistently hit target. You don't tell them what the target is. You negotiate together a target on a monthly, quarterly, annual basis. And the most valuable salespeople are the ones that consistently deliver. I don't need them to blow away the targets, but to know when I'm working with them that they have my back on sales. They're going to deliver those targets. When you can build your enterprise around consistent, manageable sales, that determines how you deploy capital throughout the whole organization. And the most valuable data you can ever get is having a great head of sales tell you, I can hit $5 million this month and does every time they say that. Consistency. Totally, it's not about rock star blowing away the number, it's consistency because the hardest thing to get, particularly in small businesses at under 500 million, is consistency of sales. It is, those people are worth gold and you should compensate them that way too. You mentioned uh, never promote your best salesman to run sales. Correct. Why is that? Because isn't that what they all do? Is <laughs> sales management of a sales team is a completely different skill set than selling to customers. It's completely different. Every person that makes that mistake regrets it dramatically, saying, oh, that's my number one salesperson, I'm gonna make them head of sales management. Sales management is a logistics problem. It's like a chess game. It's trying to figure out with all of your team where to put the right salesperson with the right account or the right region. That's nothing to do with selling the product. It's understanding how to manage the sales process, which is a completely different sales set. This is the biggest mistake. Sales management skills are different in every way. And, and hiring the right sales manager is about someone who's actually taken a team and run it for at least three years. Those people are really hard to find. And if you're just promoting somebody that just had a great region as number one salesperson, you will fail. 
What else tips would you have on hiring like a, a VP of sales or a head of sales? What else do we look for? You know, that's extremely difficult. What I do uh, when I'm bringing a new salesperson in, not necessarily head of sales, but let me tell you, the metric can st still be the same. I like to have them come in and work with my team for six months. So if I'm bringing in a new team member, could be involved in sales, very often is, I let everybody meet them first. You know, this is the old adage, hire slowly, fire quickly. You want to make sure you get team buy-in to that new person that's coming in. You don't want to change the team dynamics too much. Let everybody meet them. Maybe that's going to be four or five interviews. Then bring them in for a six-month contract. Set goals together. Whatever it is going to be, it's going to be. And either they achieve them or they don't. At the end of six months, you simply do the review and say, you are so good, all the rest of the team wants you to be here. Or you fail to hit your mandate. We knew this going in, we were going to do a trial period. I'm sorry that happened for whatever reason. People make excuses. Compensate them well and part ways. That's how I do it. Got it. What is a great interview question that you ask candidates? Oh. Well, this is my secret sauce, Vlad. I almost feel I don't want to disclose it. <laughs> but I'll tell you what I do. When you're, when you're spending time with somebody, and I like to spend a little social time with them. I love to drink wine. I have a wine business, as you may know. Wine is the elixir of truth. You know, you can talk about life in a different way. After I've determined they have the technical merits for the position, I want to find out something about the other side of their lives. What do they like in art? What do they like in music? Do they have another passion? My thesis is this, that business is very binary. It's black and white. Either you make money or you lose yeah. it. It's almost a science in that respect. The arts are chaos, and yet the greatest business leaders have somehow managed to blend the yin and yang of the discipline of business with the chaos of art. I always want to find out somebody is a singer, a guitarist, a painter, a photographer, something else that they're very passionate about, because that gives them the certain power that you don't have if all you know is business because you are a better creative thinker when, you, when you're dabbling in the arts, when you have something in your life that's distracting you away from the binary nature of business. That's my secret question. I explore that side of them. So you're almost looking for left brain and right brain people, right? But specific to the arts, you're, you're going to find everybody has a passion. I mean, I play guitar. I have a massive guitar collection. I love my work in photography. I've wanted to be a rock star, but I'm not good enough. I wanted to make a living as a photographer, not good enough, but I can run a business. So now I can take you know, my successes in business and go back and learn how to be a great guitarist, play in a band, do art exhibits with my photography. My dad told me if I pursued either of those when I was young, I'd starve to death and he was right. If you type anything, you might as well be typing on a mechanical keyboard. It's a fully customizable keyboard. That means you can set up all the caps to look exactly how you want them to look. And you can customize the sound, how it sounds, and the pressure of each key. That means you want it real tight or you want it real quick and loose. It's colorful. You're gonna light up the whole room or as little or as much as you want. You're gonna have the keys light up and then under the keys light up. It feels good to type on it. Typing on a normal keyboard is boring. But here it's actually fun. It's sturdy. That means that if you sit on your desk, since it has that aluminum plate, it's not gonna slip and move on you. It's gonna stay still. This keyboard is gonna look good on your Mac or PC setup. There's also a 30 day money back guarantee. That means if you're not happy with this keyboard, for whatever reason, drop the company that sells it. It's gonna give you your money back, no questions asked, for 30 days. And if you buy through my link, you're getting $20 off. And the company that makes this awesome keyboard is called drop.com. It's basically a community of people who just geek out about really cool products from headphones to clothing to outdoor to mechanical keyboards. And you basically talk about this with the community, with people like you, like us, uh, and you can share with drop and then drop will actually make some of the products you suggested. That means the product you've always wanted, they can make it for you. <laughs> That's awesome. So go check out, click the link, and check out this mechanical keyboard. That's gonna make your whole computer setup epic. In startups that you wanna invest in, I heard you kind of mentioned three things that... I love um, companies that are disrupting existing 
stationary businesses. And I'll, I'll use an example that's just come into my portfolio in the last few weeks. A multi-billion dollar sector is cleaning fluids in America. What do you clean your windows with? What do you clean this table with? What do you clean your clothes with, your, your dishes? These are all, 99% of them are purchased in disposable plastic containers and 95% of the products water. Why hasn't anybody disrupted that industry? Yeah. Because it's probably growing at 3%, nobody's brought any innovation to it. Then along comes this company called Blue Land. What they did was so simple. They said, why are we throwing all this plastic out? This is terrible for the environment. Why don't we give you a forever bottle made of acrylic, beautiful bottle, and we'll give you 20 tablets of crystallized cleaning fluid. This is a patented technology that was developed by a Pakistani chemist that was actually part of a very large consumer company here in America that broke free and patented a way to take a window cleaner into a crystal tablet. Drops it in the bottle, bingo. You didn't have to carry two pounds of water home. There's your window cleaner. There's your hand soap. There's your detergent. It was brilliant. I'm going to try and get that company to maybe 100, 200 million in sales, awesome. and it'll get bought for a ridiculous price. Yeah. It's a great idea. Yeah. I don't, you know, it's one of those companies you say, why didn't I think of that? Why didn't I think of that? Because they thought of it first, that's why. How can founders reach you? <laughs> Let's say if founders actually want to get in touch with you, yeah. and if there is a way for them to reach you, what should they say when they somehow do reach you? You know, Vlad, my deal flow is insane. I get so yeah. many products offered to me. I have a guy named Alex Kenji of Running O'Leary Ventures, and he has a team of people that do due diligence with him. We don't just do Shark Tank deals. We just closed a deal called MindMed, which is doing research on microdosing psychedelics to solve for opioid addiction, for depression, for alcoholism. That's the kind of company, very disruptive, great potential. I want to own a piece of it. I do now. That's somebody that just brought it over the transom, sent it in online at uh, kevinoleary.com. Alex's team did the due diligence. He liked it. It's our part, part of our portfolio now. And even Alex put a piece of his own dough into the deal. You know, here's the guy that runs the company saying, I want a piece of this, boss. I love great innovation, great opportunities, you know, great disruption. But, but I can't do every deal, yeah. obviously. So what I try and do is, is, is sift through all the offerings that come through, show them to my team, and every once in a while, we add to the portfolio. What should they include? Let's say they reach out, like what should they include? It's a very simple message, and I tell this to everybody. Never send more than 12 slides in the presentation. Never. I might get through three of them, maybe four. These decks of 35 slides go straight to the garbage. Like, I'm not going to spend that much time on it. If you can't explain to me in 90 seconds or less what the opportunity is, maybe that's three slides, into the garbage it goes. I saw you mentioned that one third of the deals that happen on Shark Tank actually close. No, more than that. More? Now. More? Yeah, more. What? Almost over half now. Half. Yeah. Is there any advice you would give to founders what they can do to increase that further? Because I'm sure it sucks to go there. Yeah. Well, the trouble is we do due diligence. We're not stupid. We have whole teams. Every shark has a whole team. Don't bullshit your numbers. Mm. I mean, I know you're incentivized under the lights of the studio to tell your story under the brightest light possible and always be optimistic. But when we go in there in a sobering due diligence session and find out, find out you lied about your numbers, your credibility goes down the drain. Yeah. And you've got to be honest about numbers. You really, really have to be able to basically explain what the idea is in 90 seconds or less. Number two is why are you the right person to execute on the opportunity? What skill set do you have? What does your team have? Did you work in that business before? Has it been in your family? Have you tried before and failed and now you know the mistakes you made? Whatever it is, you've got to connect me with that idea and tell me that you're the right person to execute. And lastly, if you don't know your numbers, you deserve to burn in hell and I'll put you there myself. <laughs> yeah. It's that simple. So think about the numbers. Uh, what are some signs that uh, you should fire an employee? That's always a tough one, Vlad. And, you know, I've fired a lot of people in my day, usually for one reason. When you're in a company, you're all paddling up the same stream together. You're all on a mission that everybody agrees on. You came into the family understanding that was the goal. When it becomes clear that you don't believe in that anymore, that you're not willing to work as hard as everybody else is, I have to take you behind the barn and you know what I have to do. Yeah. Because I don't want you 
as a cancer in my business. But I always make sure I explain why it happened, and I also make sure I compensate you very well to start your journey somewhere else, having learned from the mistake you made in my company. But I don't make a lot of hiring mistakes anymore because I have experience on how to do this. And that's why I hire very slowly, and I let the team buy into the individual, and I love to sign six-month contracts. Six-month chances to, to see if we can date before we get married. It's that simple. That works for me. But if you're not pulling your weight, if you're not on course, if you're unhappy, and you just don't believe in the mission statement anymore, I don't want you near the rest of my team. 82% of small businesses fail because of cash flow problems. Are you in the dark about your company's expenses? Now you can have complete clarity about your business with a Divi card. Divi card will allow you to set your budget, spending limits, and see every transaction in real time. You can easily manage employee expenses, pay bills, and even book travel. You can also create virtual cards and set spending limits. This way you can prevent vendors from overcharging you. If you use Divi, you don't need expense reports, employee reimbursements, and receipt tracking. Divi also allows you seamless transfer of all transactions into your accounting software, so now you can close your books faster. This is how you control your company spending and have complete clarity into what's happening in your financial part of the business. For a limited time, Divi's offering $50 to you. They're gonna give you $50 to demo the platform to you so they can show you how this product is gonna help your business be a lot more successful. Sign up for the link below and you're gonna get $50 for them just to demo the product for you. All you need to do is be a financial decision maker at a company that spends at least $10,000 a month. You mentioned that uh, a lot of your successful investments came from women-run businesses. Can you kind of elaborate some, why is this? What are you noticing that they're doing that the guys are missing or failing at? Two big things. Um, number one is they're extreme, you know, that old adage, you want something done, give it to a busy mother. Time management skills in companies that are sort of 25 people and less is very important because women know how to juggle many things. That's what a great skill set is. And so they allocate their time and the time of their employees extremely well, understanding time is a very valuable asset. That's number one. Number two, which is probably even more important, we went back and looked at our portfolio and said, why is this outcome? Why are all these women doing so well? They were setting goals that they could hit 95% of the time, even if the growth rates were significantly less, versus the guys that were hitting their targets maybe 65% of the time, but had average estimates of growth of 30%. So they were setting these testosterone targets yeah. and missing them. And the, and the difference was, when we went to measure what manifested itself over a seven-year period, we found out that in in teams where you consistently hit your goals, even if there's very low growth in the company, the culture becomes very sticky and there's no staff turnover. Mm -hmm. If you're not hitting your goals and you're only hitting them 65% of the time, people get unhappy they're not part of a winning team. It's almost like being part of the New England Patriots. Nobody wants to get traded during the season because they want a chance at winning the Super Bowl ring. But the point is, setting goals that you reach is, is a particularly interesting way to mitigate risk. And women are particularly good at it. And we found that in our portfolio that it manifests itself in extremely low turnover. So the man or woman running sales or logistics or compliance or accounting never leaves. There's no disruption to cash flows. That's what we learned. And so now we're trying to apply that to all our portfolio companies. Set goals you can achieve, even if you have to bring down your growth rates. You know, what's interesting is that's kind of the opposite of like the mantra here in Silicon Valley, right? They're always telling you the opposite. Yes. Shoot for the moon, right, Landon? But 80% of these companies fail. <laughs> yeah. So I'm not sure who's right. I mean, you know, I don't want, uh, there's a reason 80% of companies fail. They're way too optimistic about what they can achieve and they don't understand how hard the journey is. Mm -hmm. I don't have an 80% fail rate. I have a few failures, but not 80%. Mm -hmm. My companies tend to understand this is a really tough challenge and we're gonna to work together to achieve success. And success starts by staying in business. Got it. Slower growth, slower growth, but achievable and actually doing it. That's right. what the goal is. Executional skills, you know, I always tell my team, look, the one thing you have to respect is more important than anything else is experience. And the only way you can get experience is to put in the time. So when you meet somebody that has experience, you have no choice but to respect their opinion. Listen to the mentorship you get from people that have had experience in their journey that's much greater than yours. So, you know, I teach this at Harvard to these graduating cohorts of 
these really, really optimistic young men and women that are just coming out of the most, probably number one brand business school in the world, yeah. and tell them, the real world's going to chew you up and spit you out. Not all of you are going to make it. But those of you that respect experience, like the guy standing in front of you right now who's telling you this story, I know things you don't know, and the only way you'll ever get to know them is you have to experience them. And that is something somebody told me when I was graduating out of business school, and I remember looking down at him, and I thought to myself, what an asshole. And here I am now saying the same thing years later to me in the past. You know, it's that kind of a very interesting full circle of life. Yeah. It's like kumbaya. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, he also said something that I thought was, like, I actually almost never heard this before. Uh, I don't think I've ever heard this before. And you mentioned that great CEOs are phenomenal entertainers. Yeah. That Napoleon and Bismarck, how they used to sit at night and tell stories to inspire hearts of men. Uh, and what advice would you give? What can founders do to become great entertainers? What do we even, how do we achieve this? I, I remember answering that question about, about that, that came to me about leadership. And it, it really defines more than just management skills. It's about leadership. I had a history teacher in, in high school, and she, I, I was, I, I had consistently had triple A's in history or fours all the time because I was so inspired by what she was teaching me. She pointed out that in history, if you go back and look at the greatest leaders, Genghis Khan, I mean, Alexander the Great, Napoleon, more modern times, Bismarck, and then of course a, an analogy we can use in modern times here in America is Donald Trump, whether you like him or you hate him. Let's just use that analogy for a second because it's so on the minds of everybody in America. 2016, the, uh, the, the presidential elections in place and we've got Hillary versus Trump. Here's an easy way to measure it. The best media that Hillary ever got in her life were the debates she had on network and cable television against Trump. He was a storyteller. He told stories. He's, he, he still tells stories every night. He's yeah. telling stories all the time. You may not like him, but he sucks the oxygen out of the room. The reason she lost the election, whether you like her or don't like her, because she was certainly a very skilled candidate, and she had all that experience in foreign affairs and everything else, but she lost the election because she bored the voting constituency to death. There's, there was nothing to talk about in the morning about Hillary Clinton. It was all Trump. Trump, Trump. <laughs> Trump was like Genghis Khan around the fireplace with his men saying, boys, I've got another story about a battle I had. And wait till you hear this one. And the next morning, they'd say, the great leader told us about how he slayed the dragon. And it would go right through the troops and word of mouth, because they had no social media back then. Trump used social media to tell stories and ate the oxygen alive out of all the media worldwide. Nobody knew who Hillary was when the election came. It was all Trump. That's great leadership. Whether you like him or not, the story's the same for Napoleon. It's the same for Alexander the Great. It's the same for all the great leaders. Winston Churchill used to tell stories that are still printed on posters. Stories one paragraph long, two lines long. All the things that he used to say that would make people repeat them. That's great leadership. Got it. So we have to tell stories and we should keep them exciting, exciting stories. You have to tell people things that are getting you on, the, you know, they're understanding what your mission is, but it's repeatable, it's memorable. You, you, they remember what you said and they repeat it to somebody else. That should be, it's communication skills. Now luckily in America today, there are great educators of this skill. There's one that I use, his name is Nick Daly. You can Google him. He he's works with all the network broadcasters and all the people who give speeches and all the CEOs. He teaches you the importance of communicating that way. And I've been using him for 20 years. I get him to come out to a speech I'm going to give somewhere. Sometimes a speech has 9,000 people listening. And I get Nick to videotape me and then takes me out for dinner and criticizes all the mistakes I made. I'm always trying to learn from him. A great educator of storytelling and communication skills. And I bet you Trump's using somebody too. And if there was a teacher in Genghis Khan's day, he probably went into his tent as well. <laughs> you, sold, you sold your company for $3.2 billion. Uh, what motivated you daily to kind of keep going during that long journey? It was actually $4.2 including 800000 of debt. 
Um, we were on a mission. We wanted to advance reading and math scores everywhere around the world. That was the learning company. We were very good at it. Uh, we had Rita Rabbit, Carmen San Diego. We had all kinds of different titles. Uh, Mavis Beach, Beacon Teaches Typing. You find the, the, the actual brand still floating on the internet. But reading and math scores are the same in every geography all around the world, regardless of language. Every mother and father is concerned about reading and math scores of their children, and we were the solution for that. We all understood that mission. We were the largest provider of educational software to schools in America, 110,000 buildings. We were the largest provider of educational software to Apple. I used to work with Steve Jobs, and he was a really nasty guy. Yeah. A genius, but not that nice. But he knew how to motivate people. He probably used fear more than anything else, but he built an incredible company, obviously, and you can't take that away from him, but we used to have some pretty tumultuous meetings, I can tell you. Kevin, you once mentioned uh, your tears don't add any value to an entrepreneur, uh, and my question <laughs> to you is, if business is business, why does this stir people up so much? You know, I, I get accused of being the mean shark all the time, but I'm not the mean shark. I'm actually the only person there that tells the truth, because it's so disingenuous, and I say this to Barbara all the time who sits to my right, you know, you'll say to somebody, well, I'm not going to give you any money for that idea, but I think you should just go on your own and keep going. I really admire what you're doing. And I look at it and say, this business has no merit. It's going to go to zero. It's a bankrupt idea, and they're going to fail. Why not just tell them the truth? She doesn't want to hurt their feelings. I don't give a damn about their feelings. I care about their money, and I think they need to hear the truth because reality is going to chew them up and spit them out anyways, and they're going to go bankrupt. That's going to happen. And, you know, sometimes if people can't handle the truth and they start crying, I mean, you got to suck it up. That's not the first time you're going to run into adversity as an entrepreneur, and I'm delivering you that in Shark Tank. Imagine what the real world's going to do to you. So I tell people, stop your whining and take the hit, get up, and keep going. Or prove me wrong if you think that the idea, but I'm not going to give you any money for a bad idea. Tears don't have any place in business. Yeah. They really add no value whatsoever. You think I'm going to want to invest in you more after walk, watching you whimper and cry? Oh, yeah, that makes me feel more confident. I can't wait to give you more money. <laughs> That's a ridiculous premise. You've got to realize I'm looking to see you have nerves of steel so you can deliver in hard times and in good times. Don't cry in front of me. That's not going to help. You, you, you had an awesome story once where you told about an engineer who was making $5 million a year selling hedge funds about sacrifice. Can you kind of briefly touch on this story? It's a classic. I was teaching a night class. It was 6 to 9 at night, a big cohort. And um, he hadn't asked a single question all night. And he looked troubled up there, right up at the top row. And he put up his hand after we ended the class and said, OK, we're going to shut it down now. And he said, just before we go, can I ask a question? And I said, sure. Um, he said, look, I've had a really tough day today. Uh, he told the story that he was an engineer that wrote code. And he had written code to manage um, compliance. It's a cloud-based service for hedge funds that had less than $250 million. So they paid him a subscription service. And he took a lot of the. The tough, there's a lot of rules about compliance when you're running a fund, but when you're 250, you're not that big. And so the bigger guys have their own compliance department, so he found that middle market, and he was making $5 million a year. Awesome. But he was also trying to finish off his engineering. I think he was mechanical. I can't remember. He might have been computer science. I don't remember. But he said his fiance had come to him that day. This was a Thursday night, I think, and said, look, you don't spend any time with my family. You never come to the soccer games of my younger brother and sister. You never have dinner with me on weekends. You just work. That's all you do. And he said, that's true, because I'm trying to finish my engineering ticket, and I'm trying to keep this business running, and I don't know what to do. She's really unhappy. And I said, well, it's a tough one. But let's ask ourselves a pragmatic question. Great partnerships in life are ones where people understand each other's mission and goals. There's no question about it. And in this case, would I be saying or asking the wrong question if I said to you, how many people in the world are running a $5 million business when they're graduating, which is your platform <laughs> for when you graduate? Yeah. You're already a successful entrepreneur. Yeah. That is next to impossible to do, and yet here it is, you have it. Which one's easier to replace, the business or the girlfriend? Now, there was maybe two seconds of silence before hit the fan in that room, 
because it, it really got into a big debate. My point was she's the wrong partner. You don't give up a $5 million business because your partner doesn't understand what your journey is. She either gets on board or she doesn't. And it's, it's the right discussion to have before you marry because this guy's not going to stop working. I'm sure I gave him good advice when I said, think about the answer to that question. I'm betting there might be another girl in this class that just learned you make $5 million a year that maybe wants to go out for coffee with you. <laughs> what do you think? Yeah. I'm not trying to be snarky here. I'm just saying it's the wrong coupling. It doesn't work. And in life, you need to marry someone who supports you, and it goes both ways. Men and women need to understand each other because you are starting a partnership for life, and you want to stay married once you marry. It's a horrible thing to get divorced. It causes trauma. But I'm always trying to tell people, be honest, meet with her again and say, I can't give up this business. Is there any way we can keep this together where you get happy? And if she can't, I don't know. Uh, 25 years ago, the internet didn't exist. Right. right. So the kids who are born now, they're probably going to have jobs that don't even exist now. My question to you is, uh, how do we as entrepreneurs take advantage of that? And what are some, some things you think that technology will allow us to do in the future? Technology is making it easier and easier to service global customers. There's no question about that. The barrier to entry is going down and down every year to start a company. What's going up and up in cost is acquiring customers. I tell every entrepreneur, we don't know where technology is going to go because great innovation happens every day. You never see it coming. And that's why companies like IBM, which was the largest market cap company in, in the mid-80s, is now nothing. I mean, not nothing, but it's been completely surpassed by others who just ate it alive because they had bad management for a long period of time. And now they have to try and buy winners, and it's probably very dilutive. I don't know. I don't own the stock, but I'm glad I don't. But the point is they, they were disrupted by the sales forces of the world, the Googles, the Microsofts who reinvented themselves. The key to entrepreneurship is always trying to find a problem that you can solve a better way. And when you do, business grows because you're solving a problem and people are willing to pay in life and in business and in consumer goods and services. If you can make it easier for somebody to do something faster, they'll pay you for it. All of my companies have figured that out. They're, they've all solved a problem. And all they have to do now is find more customers. They've proven the model. And then all I have to do is pour the gasoline of capital on their business model and blow it up and help them be successful. And that just gives me great joy and pleasure. But they're all solving problems. So you can't tell me today, oh, you know, all the great ideas are gone. Nobody has a monopoly on great ideas. There's always the next great idea and the next entrepreneur, man or woman who can execute on it. But it's always in the context of what technology can I use, how do I understand how to use this platform, and what problem am I solving? Those are the great opportunities of tomorrow. And the last question, the last question is, uh, I just love this story. <laughs> you mentioned this. So the story, can you elaborate on the story when you said you took your son uh, on a plane to Switzerland to see your stepdad and what you told him when he said, why does he have to sit in the back? Right. <laughs> well, when, when I graduated, the, the genesis of that story is when I graduated, my mother came to my graduation and said, uh, look, Kevin, I'm coming to the graduation from your college, but I want you to know um, the dead bird under the nest never learned how to fly. And I said, what the hell does that mean, Mom? And she said, no more checks. I've paid from birth to last day of college. My work is done. You've got to go solve it for yourself. And I said, Mom, that's a great poem, but I need a little cash here. I don't have a job. I've got to pay my rent, and I've got to eat. And she said, nah, go figure it out. And she was serious. I had a tough couple of years. But you know, years later, after she passed away, and I, I became the executive, executive to her estate because I'm the older brother. My brother's two years younger. I realized that she kept a secret account um, from both of her husbands, she was married twice for her whole life, and she only spent the interest or the dividend she'd made on that. It had telco bonds in it and 23 large cap S&P stocks. The point was she never touched the principal, she only spent the interest, and she left all that principal uh, in, her, in her estate. And I think the message she was trying to tell me was she didn't believe in entitlement. She thought that would be a curse in a family. So when I had my big liquidity event, my first one, that $4.2 there were nine of us, I went across the river. That was, it was a company in Cambridge, Massachusetts. 
And we went across to Boston, at least I did, and I set up generational skipping trusts. And they were designed to take care of a child from birth to the last day of college, and then they get nothing. And my kids were like two and four years old, and I went and explained the structure to them. <laughs> they, of course, didn't understand what I was talking about. But years later, when my son, Trevor, uh, was doing really poorly in high school, grade 10, he just didn't care. And he came to me one day and said, you know, Dad, can you walk me through the trust deal again? I said, sure, Trevor, here's how it works. Mom and I are going out to a movie here in Boston, and if we get run over by a truck, you don't have to worry you're going to be able to finish high school because this trust is going to pay for everything because it doesn't look like you have to worry about college. And he said, what does that mean? I said, well, you get nothing after that, nothing. And I said to him the poem, the dead bird under the nest never learned how to fly. And he said, are you out of your mind? I said, no, no, this is how this thing works. But you have plenty of runway in grade 10. You can spend unlimited amounts on education. Today, he's in fourth year electrical engineering. He's actually interning right now at Tesla down the road here. And he's probably going to get a job somewhere. And he's cost me a fortune. But maybe it was the terror of the uncertainty that he faced, understanding it wasn't a free gravy ride, that took away the concept of entitlement from him. I meet all these screwed up rich kids that are totally entitled, they don't worry about the future, their lives have been de-risked. My mother was trying to tell me that's a curse. So my definition of, of freedom for my family now is I say, any weekend, if you want to go anywhere on earth, I don't care where it is, just let me know and I'll fly all the girlfriends, boyfriends, your friends, all the family together and we'll spend that weekend anywhere. It could be Phnom Penh, Cambodia, it could be Geneva, Switzerland, it doesn't matter. And I'll do it because I can afford to, I deserve it, I've worked my way here, on, it was hard to do. And there's no entitlement to that. That's the definition of freedom. I say entrepreneurs should realize it's not about the pursuit of greed of money. It's about the pursuit of personal freedom, to be able to do what you wish with your time. That's what success gives you. That's what you should be pursuing, personal freedom. So Trevor will often say, can I come with you to visit uh, dad in Geneva? Very often. I you know, leave on a Friday night, get there Saturday morning, have dinner with George. Fly back Sunday morning. Sounds crazy. I've done it thousands of times, I bet. And Trevor will often say, well, I'd like a break from engineering. Um, I'd like to come. So one day we're getting on the flight, and he says to me, Dad, why is it that every time we get on this plane, I have to take a left and go sit in the back, and you go up to the front where they have a bed, and they've got a giant screen TV, and they're rolling a roast beef by you on a trolley, and you're drinking wine, and I'm back in 69D. And I said, Trevor, you don't have any money. <laughs> that's the story. And that's the way it should be. He's an engineer now. Go start a company. If you want some cash, don't call me. I'm going to want a royalty. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, Kevin O'Leary, thank you so much. For thank you. Me. It was thank great. You. Really appreciate thank it. You. I hope this video was helpful. My YouTube channel is all about entrepreneurship. It's all about startups. If you enjoy videos about entrepreneurship and startups, subscribe to this channel and hit the like button if you enjoyed it. Thanks for watching.